All right, brooding. So chicks come in the mail. Ha be ready for them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's really one of the biggest things. We still sometimes are scrambling, but it is really is be ready for them. Have what you need. Don't be caught surprised. Don't have your coop freezing cold in March when you have birds coming and then you're throwing them on the ground and they're all running around for two seconds and all of a sudden they're huddled, huddled up like, help me, I'm freezing to death. Um, we've gone through a lot of systems. I, I tend to like making smaller groups of the birds, knowing your unit so you have, you know, one waterer per hundred birds and two feeders per hundred and then you're not having issues with um, uh, birds piling on each other and whatnot if things aren't working out right. So here, you know, typical tube feeders and then this is a bellwater. Everyone familiar with bellwaters? They're just really great. In a lot of ways they're great. They keep the water clean. If you have a lot of activity in your coop and the birds are bouncing around, you get a little water spillage from them bouncing um, the, uh, the water is basically, for folks who don't know, you see the water here is inside the lip. Water comes down through gravity feed into here, sits in this bell. There's a spring-loaded um, device shutoff valve here. As the lip fills with water, the weight of the water pushes the spring down and shuts off the water flow. And as they drink from the water, the weight of the water um, lessens and then it rises and then water goes back into the bell. And the most clean, which we've tried a little bit, but would be to, if you're going to start out something new, is to go to just start with a nipple water system. And if you can get that to be drip free and not have drips and whatever else, you can pressurize it. And it's it's the most clean and sanitary and best for the birds. And that's this what they use in the industry. bell water. If you do have birds that are sick and they're regurgitating into that water, then all the other birds are just drinking right behind it and getting that too. So, you know, we've gone through a lot of incarnations. A lot of people, including us, still use, do you have pictures of the heat panel? Yes, I um, Use the infrared heat lamp. They use a lot of energy and they really only heat a small area. So um, that's one from Premier. Uh, good thing about it, it's got a long cord, doesn't have a shut off though. So basics on brooding, you're providing a warm, clean area for the birds to grow up in, access to clean food, clean bedding, clean water, uh, and the ability to regulate their body temperature a little bit by being able to go under a warm source and then being able to leave that warm source if they want to um, uh, get to a cooler area of the coop. So, you know, one quick story. One time we had birds that got <laughs> that, um, we got from, from the hatchery, they came in the mail, I put them in the coop, I was doing vegetables, and, uh, and then I left, and Jen went down to check on them, and some of the birds had gotten in the water, and they got all wet, and they were like, ah, cold. So Jen was home, and she saw them, and she said, oh my God, they're... This is when we didn't have that many. This is when we didn't have that many in the beginning, but you know, the beginning things happen, and she wanted to help them, she took them, put them in a box, put a heat lamp on them, and went to work, <laughs> as a little box. Very dumb lamp. thing to do. Yeah, and they all like, they, we had yeah. bacon little crispy chickens <laughs> afterwards. That was so, a good yeah. lesson to learn. <laughs> Give them warmth, but let them have enough space to get away from it. So a little fried chicken, little you know, things. But um, and we don't do the sugar thing all the time, but yeah. So you can do the sugar. It, it the 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 packets, the stuff they sell that have minerals in them and vitamin mix for like good start. There's no studies that I've read that really show that um, anything besides giving them a little bit of more carbohydrate to help them get some more energy after their transition uh, in the mail um, helps them. The vitamins, we haven't seen uh, that it does. Apple cider vinegar, two cups per five gallons um, can just help with their gut health and in some ways can help with um, uh, more palatability. People have probably seen this, pretty standard drawing. You want the birds to look happy, not be peeping. If you go out to your coop and you hear them peeping like crazy, really loud, then there's a problem. But this is a, just a nice visual to keep in mind. Uh, and corners are dangerous, especially for turkeys. We've definitely lost, um, I mean, birds, it's interesting. There's a really cool video. It doesn't, it's more about for the, if you've ever um, want to see about the inside of a hen's reproductive tract, you know, um, Auburn University in Georgia has a really wonderful thing called the virtual chicken. You just Google virtual chicken. It's a seven minute DVD that takes you through the entire anatomy of how a hen produces and lays an egg. 
really awesome. Um, but anyway, look, learning more about chicken anatomy, like they have lungs and they don't like um, have lungs like we do that open and close with air. They just have air sacs built into their lung tissue. So if you process chickens, you feel the lungs are really hard, gushy things. So they don't expand and contract. They're just breathing through those vascular, you know, airways inside their lungs. So when they pile on each other, that's why they smother to death because they're basically suffocating each other. Because when they get too much weight on those lungs, it crushes those air sacs inside their lung. Um, so that's why you, you want to avoid piling and all that kind of stuff from having drafts because they just sit on each other and they don't realize it and then they just slowly suffocate. And that's why you can get huge losses in your brooder if the temperature is not right and they're smothering or there's some other issue that they're freaking out about running away from and piling up in the corner. Yeah, it could be sound, it could be light, it could be a lot of things that can cause them to pile up on each other. So we um, early on try to introduce, since we're going to be raising all of our birds on pasture, want them to be getting out as soon as they can, as soon as the weather and everything else permits so that they're not you know, being inside the brooder forever. Um, we used to have a situation, this used to be our old brooder at our old farm, and um, there was some pasture that we would grow for them around the outside of this, and we just have a little pop door out the back, and then they could go out into this runway that we had for the broilers, and then we divided that into two separate paddocks so we could switch groups over you know, the course of the summer. This gets pretty beat down with later groups of broilers if it doesn't grow back fast enough, but that was our way to try to get them out, get them foraging early on. Now we can't really do that with the new brooder system. Um, well, now we will be able to, but in the past. Yeah, the last couple of years when we moved away from this location to another one, Pete built a really cool brooder, which I'll show you, and then um, we didn't have, it wasn't really conducive to getting them out because it was, we put it, the thing under the, under the trees in the shade, so there wasn't much growing outside there. Um, so then this was the next um, iteration of the brooder um, in construction. We didn't have a great picture of the floor but do you want to talk about the floor system? Yeah, so it's a poultry floor. So as we've kind of gone, do this more and more, you realize, well, the commercial conventional industry has come up with some things that are good and work really well. You're like, wow, putting birds inside a barn, they don't have to get eaten by coyotes. That's a good idea too. But you know, you can kind of see why this food system has gone the way it has in some level. But anyway, that's a poultry floor. Uh, I got it from Farmer Boy Ag. Two by four sections screwed down to two by fours on end. And the great thing about that is not that much more than a wire floor, but it is smooth for cleaning. It keeps predators out. The manure is meant for chicken feet to stand on. And this system we came up with for um, having any kind of birds in there because once they get to a certain size and you're using a lot of shavings, we, we came up with this and a garage floor liner to lay on top. We put shavings on top of that. We brood in there. If it's hot, hot summer, as the birds are growing and we're not quite ready to put them out on pasture yet, I can shovel the shavings out, pull up the garage floor liner, and then that's uh, the floor underneath, and then the manure will fall through, and they're getting a lot, so we have this other picture, but there's windows on either side, and you're getting a lot of ventilation everywhere. So, see there's windows on this side, windows on that side. This was um, for early in the season, we I lowered this uh, reflective foil cover down, we had heat lamps in there, and this is also a uh, migration fence from Farmer Boy Ag that loops together. <coughs> you can make a round thing, you can make any, any size you want, and it, it's got these, um, these feet that just push onto the bottom there and they stick out this wide to give stability to the migration fence. And then you can pull those feet off and then accordion the thing back up and it folds up to something like this, hey, this size. There's no wood, so there's no mites in there. Uh, you, can, you can stick it in bleach water solution and totally sanitize it in the garbage can, and, uh, and it's great. So this is when we were getting set up for birds, and then, like I said, we can pull the whole floor and get the shavings out, and then the whole thing is open in the middle of a hot summer. There's no moisture in there. It's really much, much cooler. Coccidiosis, beautiful I don't know, shot. This is kind of a weird section for this, but... Um, yeah, we're trying to figure out um, if you can, just in the brooding thing, now that they offer the coccidiosis vaccine at the hatchery, just a little public service announcement to, to get that if you can and try to prevent it in your brooder if you can to avoid the losses in production that happen because stunted broilers don't end up catching up. But if they get coccidiosis early on because you have wet bedding or anything else and they're being gross um, in there and getting sick from each other, then preventing that is is good. All right. 
And we used to do another um, vaccine in the brooder, which was the live coccidiosis vaccine, and we would just order that separately. And then once they started offering it, we don't have to order that anymore. Right, so it's a gel pock that's got um, live coccid coccidiosis vaccine in it. It's got some nutrients in it, and it was something that we were ordering sleeves of. It was very economical. Birds would come, we wouldn't give them any food or water. They would just eat this gel pock, and it would give them um, the coccid coccidiosis vaccine. Uh, you'd know that they would have it, that they, would have, that, that they had ingested it by having a, you know, a green beak and stuff. And then you, once they consumed it, we would give them food and water as normal. All right, any other questions about so brooding? Just a quick thing about, you know, about. I think I have another couple pictures somewhere of the uh, infrared things, Do you but. Do brood your turkeys in different place than your chickens? Yes. Mm. And, in the well, brood? actually, uh, yes, and, yes and, no. and no. And actually, this year, the turkeys, the biggest thing that we learned after we haven't been doing turkeys that long is that turkeys really need turkey starter. Turkeys don't have turkey starter, they're 26%, 27% protein. They just they just don't gain strength and they just die. And so the first two weeks, we've done a lot of just, yeah, you know, they're fine with our birds in the beginning, uh, we'll just throw them in there and everything will be fine. And you'll lose 20% of your birds. Um, and so we learned that the hard way. And turkey poults are not cheap. So you can lose a lot early on. Uh, we, in one year, we ended up buying turkey poults started at like a month. And they were great value, the birds did great but they weren't the strain, the strain that we wanted. So we ended up, last year we ended up going back to buying in turkey poults. So the biggest thing is protein. Chicks. What's that? The, the chicks. Turkey chicks, yeah. And so uh, the biggest thing is making sure that protein levels are high. Water everywhere, I mean, you know, turkeys are, you know, definitely more of a challenge to, um, to raise. They get themselves into trouble very easily. I really, yes, I've been like jonesing for that for a long time. Do you have pictures of the heat plates yes, somewhere? I don't know where they are. Last year I ended up going to those plates that um, my pet ch chicken sells them. I forget the name. What's that? Anyone? There's a, there's a name of them. They're, they're really low. What I don't like about the, um, what everyone uses, the, the 250 watt bulbs, is they use so much energy and, and they put out so much radiant heat, even though they're infrared, that I just hate them, and so there's these new, these new plates that a couple different manufacturers make them. They're very low wattage, and they are come in different sizes, and you put them on the ground only up to the height of the chicken's back. Has anyone seen them? So they're, they're really low wattage, and you need a, they're, they're, they come in the biggest size they make now. They make an 11 inch by 42 inch and I think one that's more like 24 by 30 inches. They're pretty small, but they use, I think, a fifth or a sixth of the energy. And they're, to mimic, their, their design was to mimic a mother hen. So the chicks will, will go underneath that heat plate, and it's just very gentle warmth. There's no hot spots. And we line them up throughout the brooder, and they're really, really nice. The problem is they're very expensive, and you need a lot of them when you're doing a lot of birds, because one plate will only, is only good for like 50 chicks. And you still need a light because they still kind of get lost and not really knowing where the heat source is. Um, now that we're in, we have a new facility we can use at the new farm, and I want to get a, uh, a, a gas uh, breeder. I think they're more expensive to run, but the, the, the space that's heated is much broader, and we get a lot, of, we get a lot more loss in the, in the brooder than I would like. All right, now we're moving into shelter and housing section. All right, so we'll start with the... Mobile layer coops. This is our first one. Woohoo! Prototype. Pete had fun with some recycled paint. Yeah, for folks who are just starting out, <laughs> you go online. You know, there's a million and one designs of these things. Um, what they should have is they actually should not be bright inside. They should be shady inside. We know people have built them and then they put like clear panels on top. And you know, for the summer, for the winter, that's great. But for the most times, you want them to have a shady spot. They're gonna, when you put birds on pasture, they're going to have this impact zone. So if this is your shelter, they're going to impact heavily around the shelter and a little bit more uh, dispersed outside. That's why it's important to move your shelter really often. Um, so this was something that we got for free, and we built the superstructure using recycled wood and just scraped it together. 
So before um, we had any tractors or field vehicles, I mean, this was like very early on, we basically had a, a Honda CRV, and this was a camper trailer shell, no pickup truck or anything. So Pete came up with this really cool winch system to move this around before we could physically pull it around. So he basically screwed the winch down and then would like go out however long uh, to reach the, stra the toe strap and then pound in a steel stake in the ground and then literally winch it forward every day. It's great, awesome. So if you yourself don't have you know, a tractor or something big to haul a huge farm wagon around and you can build a smaller camper trailer and you don't, want, you don't have the strength to pull it because it's bigger than you want, this was a nice system that he yeah, designed to do that. It worked for a long time. You know, um, it was the capacity that we had at the time. I didn't want to keep driving into the field was a big thing. I just want, I didn't want any impact on the pasture at all. And so it worked fine, you know, driving a stake every day was a little bit old and I'd drive it in and then I'd start, grind, you'd start cranking it and then the stake would bend and move and I'd be like, oh crap, I gotta do it again. And, but it, it worked fine. And then that next generation was a st you know, standard farm wagon, um, eight foot wide by 20 something feet long. And we painted it. We painted it red and white, barn colors. And you know, water tank inside, 250 gallon water tank inside, bell water on the outside. So the first thing we got over was Hauling water was a drag. As soon as you start to scale birds, you're dragging all that water, doing little mobile water, little waters was terrible. And so as soon as we could, we went up to a big tank, gravity fed water to the outside. All of a sudden your water chores are once a week. And then we went up to building another one. And then um, at that time we had nest box coops on the inside and on the outside. And then we were dealing with, with birds roosting inside the nest boxes and pooping in there and then eggs getting dirty and then we were washing eggs all the time. And then it was kind of a drag. And so Jen and I were talking one day and we said, what if we build a coop just for nest boxes? And so that's what we did. The middle one we call a nest box coop. It's seven feet wide by seven feet tall so it can fit into a greenhouse. And it's got 40 boxes on each side. A, um, uh, automatic door opener on each side so it's sort of fail safe in case one automatic door opener doesn't work the other one hopefully will the birds very quickly learn to go inside there and lay and then the tarp sides roll up sides the, all the eggs roll out to the side so we don't have to go in um, yeah there it is yeah so roll out so there these are the standard cool brand um, rollout nest boxes are really expensive. We don't have a picture, but as we grew our flock, you can see the eggs really pile up because those little compartments are really small. What they ended up doing is they ended up cutting these off and tilting the nest boxes um, from the bottom out to increase the rate of the eggs would flow out. And then I built these galvanized cages that basically increase the capacity, the holding capacity for the eggs fourfold. So the, the, the eggs now roll out really far away from the birds so they can't really stick their, their necks as easily underneath to eat them. And it's just a bigger reservoir to hold a lot of eggs. So now we can go and collect, you know, 60 dozen eggs off of the coop like this where before, you know, each compartment would hold, you know, much less. So, so basically there's a, it's hard, I wish I didn't have a good yeah. picture of it, but there's a whole like wire steel, um, kind of a runway all along back in there. So the, the eggs can roll out and then they're all along the thing after you roll it up. So they're not these individual. And they're all aligned with nest pads, blue nest pads. So we don't use any shavings or straw. It's very clean. We can take those nest pads out, bleach them, clean them, put them back. And we do have all the, the nest, pad, um, nest pads inside the nest boxes. So they don't like to be on the slippery plastic without something on them. So those are in there. Yeah, they're very expensive, but um, it's been a good system. But you have the next one. What's the next one? That's the inside. And, that, and that's the way the coop looks. There's no poop in there. So when we go and collect eggs, and these are just different you know, boxes that we've gotten over time. And um, when we go to collect eggs, the bird, so the doors open at you know, four in the morning, and then they close at around noon or one o'clock. And sometimes you get stragglers in there. So when we collect eggs, we climb in there. We push the any birds that are left in there when we're collecting eggs in the afternoon. So there's no birds roosting in there overnight. And keeping the birds from not sleeping in your nest boxes is huge because that means your nest boxes stay clean and then you're not cleaning poopy eggs. So we went from you know, looking at buying a $10,000 egg washer to saying, well, 
We don't want to wash eggs to start with, so let's tackle the root of the problem, which is trying to get clean eggs to start with. So a friend of ours, and we're kind of, this is sort of the next generation. People are um, moving towards systems that developed in the industry. So colony nest boxes, anyone's ever visited a real production house, the birds aren't laying in little nest boxes, they're laying in huge, what's called colony nests. And so they're um, big, it's not a real picture of it here, but they're basically elevated nest boxes that are in huge sections that are open as big or bigger than the table and they have little curtains hanging over them so the birds are going in there and you know they're all lined up like laying next to each other and they're not segregated at all with little boxes and they roll down to a central belt and the belt then carries the eggs away so um, we started looking into this a couple of years ago we haven't done it yet but now this guy in Pennsylvania and a few people now are uh, using that same central uh, laying system you have, you have another picture with, and they're adapting it to these portable systems. So, so they've got the poultry floor inside their nice big mobile coop in there. So that's the black stuff. Right. And then they've basically come and on the top of their coop is a solar panel. They just turn it on. You can watch the video on their thing. And that just slowly rolls the eggs down to you and you can just collect them all like that. And the great thing about these nest box systems, and there's a million companies that make them, one called Dutchman, Potter Systems who Pete and Jerry's up in Vermont, use a different company. And they're very similar. The, the great thing about them is that they have um, a system where, they, where they're laying in there and then they have exclusion devices so they kick the birds out of the box and force them to stay out so they can't poop in there. Some of them have systems where they have wires that push the birds out. Some of them have a better system where it actually raises the floor, pushing the birds out, exposing the nest pads to the chickens who then peck at the nest pads of debris that's in there from them stepping in there. And they naturally clean the nest pads themselves and the nest pads and the floor floor lower back down. Um, I think to do, uh, I think Pat spent $6,000 for a system that will be for, I think, 800 birds. So it's an investment, but Again, the time you invest in keeping your eggs clean is less time that you're washing them. And not only that, collecting, climbing in coops and collecting, all that kind of stuff.